data represents real things. And it represents real things at a nuanced level, depending upon context. Mm -hmm. So if you've gone through that transformation and renaming process, all of a sudden, the real things are different. You're spending all your time reconciling and trying to get it back into, you know, kind of what it meant at origin. And mm -hmm. without understanding this fundamental problem of incongruence, and then you can add to that the newest problem of relational you know, processes that are rigid and structurally rigid, hard to manipulate and change. They've got this kind of location-based problem. And all of a sudden you've got things that don't match in rigid environments that are hard to manipulate. You can't look at things in the right way. It's hard to aggregate them and get a viewpoint and you can't do what if scenario planning. And this in essence is the data dilemma I do have questions because I was interested in the comments you made. I have a lot of colleagues that are in, been in and out of banking and insurance service industries. Yeah. And one of the comments I've heard recently, and recently being within the last few months, is, and I've heard this from two of my colleagues, that, and when you mentioned standardization, that caught my attention because they said they are having a really hard time trying to explain to the management of these banks that in order for the data to be integrated properly, you have to have some form of standardization for this, just generally. Mm -hmm. And they said, and they are, are shocked at how backwards and behind the times they are on understanding this and the data data issues. And they do have data issues, mm -hmm. particularly with privacy data and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And uh, so I was kind of surprised to hear that because I thought banks were a little more aggressive in that area. Now, I don't have a big banking background. I have a very limited banking experience. So I thought maybe some comments on that would be helpful. Yeah, you don't mind if I set the stage a little bit because up until recently, data was really just technology because mm -hmm. the goal was to acquire, store, integrate, and distribute data. And that's what these businesses grew on because they were able to harness the power of technology and put it to work. And all of a sudden they have lots and lots of silos doing it and they're all operating independently. And then we have yep this congruence problem that we can get in and talk about. What they all miss is an understanding of the principles of content as opposed to the principles of technology distribution, right? So technology is acquire, store, distribute. Content is what does it represent? What does it mean? What are the obligations? And then if you look at the fact that we've managed it separately, that repository is run by software that has its own glossaries and data models that are different from each other. And all of a sudden we've made, we've transformed the data to match the software to drive the business process. And you do that over and over and over again. And all of a sudden you've got incongruence, I call it a marriage counseling problem, between those repositories. So the senior execs at the banks must understand data represents real things. And it represents real things at a nuanced level, depending upon context. Mm -hmm. So if you've gone through that transformation and renaming process, all of a sudden the real things are different. You're spending all your time reconciling and trying to get it back into, you know, kind of what it meant at origin. And mm -hmm. without understanding this fundamental problem of incongruence, and then you can add to that the newest problem of relational you know, processes that are rigid and structurally rigid, hard to manipulate and change. They've got this kind of location-based problem. And all of a sudden you've got things that don't match in rigid environments that are hard to manipulate. You can't look at things in the right way. It's hard to aggregate them and get a viewpoint and you can't do what if scenario planning. And this in essence is the data dilemma. And we do a poor job, Frank, of educating top of the house that this is what it is. And this is the problem to address. And we had, we tend to go out and, and do other things. We miss the fundamentals. Well, this is yeah, this was a good point you brought up about, you know, there's so much stuff going on, particularly with, with all the mergers and acquisitions and things, the divestitures that are going on. 
I find how the heck do you plan strategically when you have no idea that next year you may be spinning off something or buying something and yeah. you're not involved with that. The strategic planning didn't take that into account. It's an opportunity that came up. For example, yeah. you've got banks that are that are having a problem right now and they're looking for somebody to acquire them. Well, nobody planned on that bank failing at that time, right? And here the opportunity comes up and all of a sudden, how is it that you plan for that in an organization? That is really- well, uh, Badly. <laughs> <difficult>. <laughs> <laughs> it's now. No, no, uh, it's, it's kind of funny because this, this era of merger and acquisitions has happened to us plenty of times. And yeah. we've seen it in financial services be the problem, right? You know, you big bank acquires other big bank and all of a sudden they go from 50 repositories of customer data to 120 repositories of yeah. customer data. All of a sudden they're completely different. They don't know what they have. They can't integrate them. I remember this big story I was watching when uh, Reuters acquired Thomson Reuters, I mean, uh, Thomson Corporation. And, and it was, how do you then, and Thomson Corporation itself was made up of all these acquisitions, never integrated. And now Reuters was made up of all these acquisitions, never integrated. We're sitting there going, we still don't know what we have. We cannot unravel the things in these organizations to bring them together for economies of scale and get rid of duplicates and all of the challenges we have. We still have that problem. One dimension of it is data, right? So you get your data harmonized. So at least you know, you know, that customer number is the same thing as customer ID is the same thing as, you know, cust, you know, you know, any other name that you have for it. I remember this one conversation in one of these acquisitions, there were literally 25 separate column names for a customer within one business unit, within one geographic region mm -hmm. of one of these large financial institutions. Yeah, I find that to be pretty common, seriously, because I've been in data a long time. I was a data bigot for years. Yeah. And I find that it, it's not unusual to have 15 to 20 definitions of customers or more. And that's true of almost every column name. Very few. And then the other one is column name like 1736B. Yeah. Sure. What the hell is that? <laughs> right. Not only that, Frank, but this is a, a completely solvable problem. Yes, it is. So this is why this is all gets exciting, because if you can make people aware of what the problem is and the liabilities associated with it, and the fact that it is a solvable problem, it should become a straightforward business objective. And we're kind of on that pathway, I believe. So well, you, you, a... you, you guys talked about a few things here. I want to probe into something. The need for data standards. And I hear that a lot. I would like to think that there's a need for semantic standards. Can I, can yeah. I take a shot at this, Jeff? Yeah. As, as I, I live in a standards world and I try to simplify everything. And I'm going to say there's only three standard concepts that we really care about in data. One is standards for identity. And when I mean identity, I also mean, you know, not only what it is, but where it is. So it's also location, mm -hmm. right? And right now we've got lots and lots of identifiers representing lots and lots of the same thing used in different ways. Right. And Managing identity using web standards allows us to do a Rosetta Stone of all these things that represent real stuff into one activity and will change the way that we all operate. So mean identity is one. Mm -hmm. And then meaning is the other. And meaning itself is only two things. There are simple facts about things, and let's just use a, a legal entity, you know, name, address, date of origination, place of business, you know, simple facts that can be verified. But there are also relationship facts, you know, ownership, obligation, doing business with, guaranteeing the relationship. And you put simple facts and relationship facts together and you get absolute precision of meaning because these things are real, right? They represent real entities and real relationships and real facts. 
Hmm. So identity, meaning, and then rules, right? You know, how we calculate our hmm. business outcomes, our business rules. And, and you, that's it. Identity, meaning, rules are the key standards that everybody in data needs to think about. Okay, so let me ask this question, because this has been bothering me for a few decades now. What is reality? <laughs> well, uh, that's easy, because it's observable things that exist. Our problem is not reality, it's the capture and expression of reality. So things exist, and that's real. People exist, that's real. Customers exist, they're real. They exist, and they have legal realities behind them. So we know, I think we know what reality is. Well, uh, let, me, let me ask the question differently then. Wait, wait a minute. Is there a universe? Is there a universal? Don't go there, wait. Go ahead. How do you account for something like a neutrino, which they didn't know existed? Well, now that they know it exists, it's, it's real. Okay. It's real. It's just yeah. unknown at the moment, yes. It's unknown at the moment. So what, the point is, we don't, have, we don't know the unknowns. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. You know, that, yeah. That's very true. We don't know it's everything. It's true of a lot of stuff, yeah. 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 So reality so, becomes hard to define, is my point, because we don't know what belongs to reality. We have just what we can see and observe, like you said. You know, if you can observe it and see it, then technically it's real. Then you got the group that says we're all a simulation anyway. So <laughs> Yeah, but well, you know, it's hard enough for us to deal with those. Let's, let's let's solve the simple stuff first yeah. before we deal. <laughs> so so let me poke at this for a moment because there's the standard, you know, discussion about there was an accident and there were two cars. One was blue and one was red. Okay. And when you ask people what happened, they're going to get different colors and different types of perspectives on what they believe was reality. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, literature coming out about what we perceive as real, mm -hmm. what we understand about the knowns, right? Mm -hmm. And the things that we don't know, uh, we tend to fill in the blanks with other things or our belief systems to explain the unknowns, to your point, Frank. And there's that tendency of humans to take a narrow view of things and a shorter term view of things rather than the longer term view, which may actually be a better representation of reality. Oftentimes we see things at a smaller and smaller cycles without really understanding what the reality of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that those kinds of perspectives, there's a temporal aspect to it which I think is really important as it pertains to reality. And I think it's important that we take into account a, another aspect of how we shape it. The simple facts, the relationship facts are important. I think the rules that, that help us describe that. But I think there's also something around the context within those as well. And some of that context is the scenarios that occur. So, so you're, so you're, um, you're conflating a couple of things. One is the, the real thing that occurred. The second thing is our understanding of it, our capturing of it, our expression of it, whether we, you know, are clear about it. And those are separate things. Both exist. I like to keep these things in their place. I will say just for the simplest things that exist within an organization, Identity, meaning, time, you said temporal, the time, and source are really all we need to understand context, right? Identity and meaning, so what the thing is, time, when did it occur, right? So the price at trade might be the different than the price at settlement, fine. And source, do I trust the New York Times origination more than I trust Fox News? That's an opinion. And but you can have those opinions, but you put mm. those four things together and we can, I believe, capture and express most things precisely in context in organizations. So classic example, we probe the, the different parts of the company, how satisfied are customers? The classic question. Mm -hmm. Marketing says, okay. Sales says, fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
Engineering says, not so sure. Customer support says, not very good. Mm -hmm. Now, are they all wrong? Are they right in their own, how can I say, context? Or is it that we're not able to capture the reality? Well, that's objective reality. And, and satisfaction is, not a, is a more complex question than does the product exist? Or you know, does the interest rate exist? Mm -hmm. uh, and what is it? So the more complex the criteria, the more variable the answer is going to be. And that's okay. That's that's what makes, you know, humans, you know, operate. Okay. So if we're trying to advance ourselves and our products and our services, part of the challenge, of course, is to say, how do we assess the reality of where our product and our service is relative to those of our competitors? And then further, what are the things that we need to improve upon to move those forward and to make a difference? And mm -hmm. the question of, well, if marketing and engineering and sales and you know the executive team are not aligned or they have different perspectives on what those realities are, there may they may or may not make the right decisions and investments to move the company forward. Let's okay. pause for yeah. one second. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead, Frank. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick one. This is what I saw. This is in the medical industry. You, you design an instrument, okay, of some sort for, for medical use in a hospital or something. Then the discussion comes up. The engineers have done it, like you said, and they said, this is great. The cost is fantastic. And the customer service and salespeople come back and they said, no, this button has to be green. This one has to be loose. And then the engineers said, that's going to drive the cost up. And they said, then plus 10% of people are colorblind anyway. You know, and so you, you get into these, these context discussions is what I would call them. But the fact of the matter is the customer won't buy it unless the damn emergency button is red. Okay, <laughs> you know? Especially if you're in an operating room or something like that. So now you're stuck because you have a context of the, of the customer and marketing people differs from the engineering. If you want a really good example, go look at O'Hare Field, look at the old terminal designed by an engineering firm, and look at the United Terminal done by an architecture firm. Totally different. Yep. You're always comfortable, literally, no matter how crowded the United Terminal is. The other one, you feel like a rat in a maze. And what have let they done? They modify the old one. <laughs> let, me, you know, let, me, let me again try to simplify this activity. Okay. And I do it with a fundamental premise that I've adopted philosophically that says the goal is meaning not words or labels. And our labels and words are variable and can mean different things to different people in different contexts. And it's one of the beauties of language. But the thing itself is a real thing. And you could even take customer satisfaction from a user perspective which is different thing than customer satisfaction from a sales perspective, which is customer satisfaction from an engineering and design perspective. They're all three real things. And yes, our ultimate goal is to look at all three of those and make some wise decision about you know, our direction we're gonna take. But first, let's understand things for what they are. Then you add priority, then you add circumstance, then you add you know, anything else to it, and uh, you can come up with a, you know, a strategic answer. So mm -hmm. meaning, not words, in my opinion, is, is the fun a fundamental lesson I've learned in my four decades. Right. So you let's go back to something that you mentioned earlier, Mike, because I think it's worth pursuing from a strategic perspective. Getting the executive team and the, the decision makers at a higher level to understand the importance of meaning. Yes. Now, if they say, well, we already understand, you know, the thing, the question is, do they understand it sufficiently to make the right decisions? In other words, you, you, you said the magic word. There's a lot of complexity out there. And they may understand a slice of the thing, but if they don't understand 
how things relate to other things, the relationship thing, and then how those relationships matter in terms of how things change from a statefulness perspective and how things translate into actions and consequences, good and bad. That's the causality reality versus the what we think will happen, which is our probabilistic, you know, assession, assessment of what we think may be the future state. Okay, the, 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 this is a good point because you remember I told you one time that I did this talk last September in London and I was talking about strategic alignment and I use an analytic called path to point. Mm -hmm. right. 35 yeah, right. people in there, nobody had ever seen this analytic and these are business analysts. I said, well, how do you know the vertical and horizontal relationships that form the context around what you're doing? Nothing. We don't do that, we do requirements for systems. Okay, that's beginning of a problem. This is a very narrow view of what analysis is, okay? And for what they're doing, it's correct. That's what they're supposed to be doing, but it doesn't define all of business analysis. It's much more broad than that, right? So what happens is that your context is limited by the scope of the silo or the project or the initiative that you're dealing with. And anything else requires added funding to go out and take a look at. And plus knowledge of analytics that'll help you do this, which most people don't have. We talked about this last time, I think of the management knowledge about what type of analytics makes sense for certain type of actions. Mm -hmm. All right. So a couple of things occur to me and, and um, I just finished doing this research and I'm happy to make my, my papers being published right now on the costs and obstacles of adoption of semantic standards. And I discovered a bunch of things. First of all, top of the house usually gets the joke pretty easily. They're very smart people. And if you they give, give you the time, you explain it, they understand it. And they understand the implications of it as well. In too many organizations, I deal mostly with larger organizations, in too many of those organizations, the level of organizational bureaucracy that you have to deal with between top of the house and the lowest practitioner is is great and they are stuck in ways and there's lots of human things that get in the way of getting all of that alignment so the top of the house needs to understand that its real task is governance is control over those processes not being able to control the nuances of data management in a fragmented industry's activity the second problem is priority. They might get the joke, but do they care enough to go through the challenge of change, particularly when they are, you know, maybe focused on next quarter's results against external pressures? I mean, you know, there's lots of things there. And then you have to look at that in context of all of the activities that relate to it. Right? So when you look at the complexity, it's not just data, but it's the systems and your processes and your rules and your people and your, you know, capabilities and skill sets. And, you know, th there's a lot that goes into deciding to move the ship from this direction to this direction. And we have to recognize that reality. That's okay. So you covered a lot in that response, Mike, the you mentioned the word meaning, which I think is the heart of why we're doing a lot of this stuff. And the challenge, you know, from ancient times, Tower of Babel continues with what is, you know, how do we achieve meaning? And then how do we shape the meaning so that we can understand how to make decisions, whether they be for priority, what goes before something else, or what actions to take, discrete or complex, to respond to, you know, one or more factors that might influence, you know, the future state of where we want to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recognizing how decision making works, you know, for individuals and the limitations, like you were mentioning. Many times we fall into the biases of the short term or what's on my plate and everybody's got different, you know, biases. Or what I know or exactly. what I've invested my whole career right. in. Yeah. <laughs> so 
<laughs> part of the challenge with meaning that's and decision making is the relevancy of the context in order to make the right decisions. So think about this from the standpoint of a large organization and how hard it is to get them to change. We often talk about this sand in the engine we call culture. And it's sort of a fabric and glue. At the same time, it slows everything down because you have to try to get everybody on the same page of meaning and to set their priorities down as they decompose what they believe is the problem space and map it to their own context and realities so that they all make these decisions in alignment to achieve this bigger goal. And so, this uh, is the inertia that, you know, how do we yeah, move yeah. these along? Yeah, it's, re it's really, really good, really important. But I think you've created a, um, a hierarchy in my mind that we should also keep in in our in present in our discussion, right? So meaning is the easiest because it is a thing. It's a real thing. And we can identify and model that real thing. We can do that. So the meaning part of it is actually the easiest expression of the meaning is the first area where it gets all whacked out, right? We express it using different languages, different codes, different structures. And all of a sudden, what was precise at origination, defined at a granular level, is no longer either precise or granular. And that's a real challenge. So you have to have meaning first, then you have to be able to express meaning in a consistent, repeatable, processable, testable way. And then you can make priority decisions based on what's important, what's possible, and what's to your business objective. And we can't confuse those things. So at least if we're talking about the data problem, mm -hmm. the meaning of customers, products, transactions, partners, activities, transactions, those are all real things. We know what they are. Right. And, I, and, I, and I've worked with a bunch of modelers. We can model pretty much all of it. <laughs> Boxes and lines, you know, but model it. What, what is it? Expressing it, however, is a challenge because it's already embedded into systems and people defend their stuff. And my... Back office worry is not the same as your front office worry, and I don't care about you, and I have more power than you, all that stuff that goes on. So we don't express it the same, which is okay when we work vertically. And yes, that's why businesses operate. They know how to do this. But in our new world of straight through processing and automation and complexity, we're trying to link it up horizontally. And that now becomes the biggest problem if it's expressed differently, we don't know that this is the same as that in the same context. And that's a huge gap because you can't make decisions if you don't fix that problem. Yeah, that this is this is true. When I when I've taught I've taught a series of process management courses now for almost 20 years, and it's gone from just doc documenting a process to now I'm doing courses in hyper automation. And the most common comment I get after the fact, usually months later, somebody contacts me and says, I had no idea this process impacted all these other operations. Yes. as well, you know, we covered in the class how to do that, but they said, my management says, don't do that. We're only concerned with what we're doing here. Not realizing that it had all these hidden relationships to all these other places. And this is what Path to Point does for you, for example, as an analytic, it helps you find these things. Yep. And it leads me back. I says, I, so I asked the class one time, I says, if you look back historically at your organization, what is your degree of uncertainty in what you see? Probably 25%, because you know a lot. It's history. Whether the data is good or bad is indifferent. You know maybe 75%. Well, how about your speedometer? How well are you doing now? Well, that may be a little less. That may be 60%, because you don't really know how well you're doing. Because how about looking forward? They said, we're lucky if it's 25 <laughs> Then we know what we're doing. I said, yeah. there lies a problem. Because in order to move that up, you have to find out what type of things can I do to understand my alternatives in the future. That's not easy. That you know, I have a, 
I have an, ex an example in the financial industry. So I, I sat through the 2008 financial crisis as part of the regulatory process after the fact. And, and first, you have to look at any large bank with all these systems and everything being, you know, misaligned, incongruent. And they look at the world through their own lens, right? You know, liquidity or interest rate risk or, you know, you know, lots of different things they look at. And then you take that one financial institution, multiply it by 30, you know, the big ones around the world, right? <laughs> And they all do the same, have the same problem in a different way. And they're all reporting their stuff to the regulators who are like, what, this one does not match this one. The language you're using here does not necessarily <laughs> reflect the language. You're using. Yep. And all of a sudden, when we're trying to look at linked risk, you know, this bank, that agent, this guarantor, that obligor, this trading partner, we have no idea who owns who, who's obligated with who, who finances who, and who's holding a bag in the case of default. Mm -hmm. And and every one of those heads of, of the agencies back in 2008 recognized that we've got to solve this problem. We are flying blind, absolutely flying blind. How so? That's so. Let's look at the the more. You touched on a couple of things earlier, Mike, and I think it's important, you know, if we could go back and revisit some of these things, you mentioned the word and one of the challenges with not only the islands of data, but the incongruent systems and, of course, the, the horizontal challenges of meaning. These all suggest problems of not only communication, but also with topic of integration. And yes. in a world that is increasingly interdependent, integration is something that we struggle with, not only to see, well, what's impacted by other things yep. when we make decisions. In supply chains, we have a sense of it, but we don't understand the layers of environmental impacts until it's too late, as we yep. have seen recently. But as we move, and, and there's an important thing that you pointed out, you know, with what you were saying, Frank when it comes to speed. Because as we move faster, there isn't time to just integrate. We have to be able to understand, assimilate, and then take action, which is more of an interoperate. And the problem is, is that, you know, nature has, a, you know, evolved millions of years to figure out how different things need to interoperate to in this fabric that we call the natural world and environment. Our artificial worlds are still very, very immature in that in on a time scale that's not even close to that. But more importantly, we're moving way faster than nature ever evolved to. And we haven't maybe put together the industrialized capabilities to integrate well, to do meaning at scale, let alone to interoperate. And we're starting to put all these technologies that are making decisions and we don't know what the impacts are. Let's unravel that a little bit, Jeff. I think that's really important. And I'm going to make it worse. Because in addition to the meaning of things, we have the lexicon of things. And if I look at just data and business, you know, so business terms, business concepts, business calculations, and business outcomes are not the same as data terms data concepts, and data connections. And those are, just to pick on Frank a little bit, not the same as systems terms, systems definitions. So the first part of marriage counselor counseling problem is our organizational lexicon, mm -hmm. right? The, the second part of that is meaning, right? And once you understand all of this context, identity, model, standard language, and rules, right? You, know, you, you, can, you can capture and express that. But first, we're still talking at diff about different things, right? Because the whole goal of all of this is integration, right? We want all of our systems to, to link up so we can look through our processes, so we can automate them, so we can eliminate redundancy, so we can, you know, find out where our risks are, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, everything starts with the ability to integrate this fragmented world 
into a unified view of of stuff you know in the standards semantic standards world we call it a thing you know the world of things but what are they so we have to understand that we must understand that we must understand lexicon we must understand the meaning of things and we must express them in a standard way before we can then accomplish the tasks of integration inventory management aggregation you know quality assurance you know, all the things that we the goals are dependent upon all these prerequisites and we all are impatient right we try to jump the queue and that doesn't work if you don't fix the underlying stuff it's harder much harder to do the difficult work that we're all you know in business to do right let, let, i have a question for you frank you know, you pointed out something that's very interesting about you know, how requirements for systems, generally speaking, are a subset of like the greater realm of business analysis. And I think what Mike just touched on is an example and, you know, specific talking points around how oftentimes we think through a systemic approach around process or system without really understanding the greater integration points and how these things may need to influence those decisions and fit together to solve maybe a business need or a larger need. And it suggests more of, you know, a, a, maybe that bigger picture to build on what Mike just said around integration of things. We may need to take that to the next longer term and say, are we, is our end goal to eventually create a, an, a more of an ecosystem of things for what we have built artificially and it how does how do we then figure out how those individual ecosystems fit together and to the larger realm of what we think is the reality of nature and you know our position in you know the reality that we think it is I don't know if we have that perspective when we make decisions. Yeah, I could probably summarize the response over a period of about two or three hours for that one. That won't take that, okay? <laughs> but what does come to mind when you mention this is a concept that Brian Arthur has promoted a lot from Santa Fe Institute, which is the concept of assemblage. And I think this helps understand more complex things that we have in our environment, whether they're systems or airplanes. And he uses the airplane as an example. He says, you have parts, you have engines, and then you have the, the, the fuselage and the thing, you know, and you go all the way up till you got a plane. And this is an assemblage, like a bill of materials of things. The difficulty we have, now I've worked in this area with systems, okay, specify how would you have a data factory, for example. Well, you have to have a bill of materials of what to put into that data. They don't do this. They don't even think about it. I said, well, you know, how would you assemble this data into a mart from a large set, extract your parts, create you know, a product from that and give it to the client. Now, you know, you and I both know that CPG firms do this, okay? But they do it by hook or by crook, you know, is basically. So I had proposed a X XML type data warehouse concept with a bill of materials. They really like that. Management would not implant it. They do it by hand, 800 people. Interesting. And yeah. of course, XML is still relational because they're now into semantic technology. But you, what, everything you just described is completely yeah. accurate. Yeah, it's lacking. All this stuff is yeah, missing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll reinforce it, Frank, with a story, if you don't mind. I was I was invited up to present to the exec management of a large bank in Toronto. And I'm sitting in the, <laughs> you know, the, the conference room table and in walks the data group, humble, kind of hiding in the corner, afraid of everything. And, and, and then in walks, basically, let's call them the masters of the universe, right? Yeah. They were dressed at it and sat on the complete opposite side of the table of this humble data group. And the person who invited me was a chief operating officer, and he was sitting right in the middle. And my and my goal when they was invited was to explain what was going on with BCBS 239 regulatory activity, mm -hmm. you know, and what did it mean? And uh, the biggest master of the universe, universe looked me right in the eye and said, Mike, you are not going to fuck up my trading system implementation, are you? And I go, well, you know, it's not me. I mean, you know, I'm just telling you what's going on in, in the regulatory world. But, you know, he, all he cared about was his myopic product project. 
because it had taken him four years to get it funded. It was yeah. underway. Yeah. We didn't want to have to do anything to jeopardize momentum because it was really critical, particularly not something as pissant as data standards. Yep. You got there. Get- I know that one. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting. If these folks were going, let's go back to the ecosystem concept. If we applied a little bit of biomimicry and said, okay, I'm going to create a new plant species, but I don't really care about chemistry or biology. I simply just want to create a new plant species. So, you know, maybe we give them, you know, some genetic engineering tools. Don't worry about the fundamentals. Let's just go ahead and let's see what we can come up with. Never mind the regulatory impacts and the ethical impacts of that, but it probably wouldn't be successful. And when we ignore the fundamentals that you're really calling out over here with data standards and just assemblage where we're starting to think more in terms of, you know, what are the ingredients, if you will, that go into the recipe to create this, the bill of materials, if you will, the, when we ignore those kinds of things, how is it that we can build, you know, a, you know, a, a, how do we build on productivity and products and on top of additional things if we're not applying some measure of discipline around engineering and scientific disciplines and just free willing it? <laughs> you can't. Uh, Frank, Frank, I think you, you touched on exactly the right concept, which is the information factory. It, you know, d- data is a manufactured product. And it we would all be well served to understand that. Not and it's not and it's let's also keep it in context, right? It's just data, it represents things, but it is a critical factor of input yeah. into other things. So if we don't have that data factory, the supply, the inventory, the transformation processes, the the, the movement of it across, how it gets combined and calculated then Jeff, there's no way to do the goal, which is what you're talking about. Yeah, this is a good point because when you mentioned that, I said, and and I'm going back to what you said something earlier, why was the CPG people capable of doing this? Because this particular company organization was being bought out at the time and the people buying it out liked this idea, okay? Their management then was a problem. But here's why they could do it. In the CPG industry, what is the most standard thing they have? Their data. Because they can't compare if they don't. They have to look at CPG as consumer package goods across the entire nation and across the world, basically. So they have to have some standardization of how the data works, and they're very good at it, as a matter of fact. So this leads back to your comment about if we don't standardize this stuff, it's not going to work. And that's correct. They did this. Think of what happened at the turn of the century, and I go probably, I mean, not this last century, but the one before that, because I go back even before that. When you had electrical engineers... They used to design the wiring in a building and the outlets and everything else. When that became standardized, they went to work for the companies that make those products. They make the outlets and everything else. They went to work for them. What's happening now? Programmers are going to work for the company that makes software packages. And so that there, there's been a decrease recently in computer science majors in universities. And the reason is the jobs are changing because that, that business is maturing. And I think the standardization part is happening little by little. But, but, not for, but not standards, yet, but not yet for data. I'm, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. I was just going to say, and, and those are great examples of how we built a progression right. and we've accelerated innovation and productivity, but it hasn't happened with data for some it reason. Hasn't. I don't know. I Tell me why it hasn't happened with data. Well, because we assume that you turn the data spigot on and the data comes out and almost all of our effort has been built on technology and process, and people do not understand data, Mm -hmm. which is why we have to get back to those fundamental foundational principles to say technology, people, process, and data, the four building blocks of every organization, data should not be the poor stepchild to all of those, but it is. And, And when we don't teach it, we don't teach it in university, We don't teach it in organizations. We just assume, and and if it's a big problem, I'm just going to isolate my activity. I'll do it myself in my silo. You know, I don't have time to mess around with enterprise anything. I'm going to do my, 
my stuff. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it's chaotic. But yeah, didn't, chaos didn't we face this same problem when for the first hundred years didn't have any real standards? And everybody said, well, this is how I think medicine should work. This is how I think the chemicals or what we think, how the, how the world interacts with things. There was no understanding of the basic, you know, standards around like elements and chemistry and those things. Once they become the knowns versus the unknowns, we had, we could start to build upon that, but I haven't seen that. Well, we, we don't seem to learn that lesson very well. In Remember time. something you said earlier in one of our earlier conversations, the science was not done. Yeah. They were missing science. And I'm wondering if we, you know, the term data science may not be correct the way they use it today. Right. They use it in terms of the analytics applied to data, not on the data itself. Right. Yeah. Maybe the data science should apply to the data itself and how we look at that. Much the same ways you have to do for medicine and you have to do for everything else. You have to tackle the science, then the engineering, and then the development, then the product, and so on. Uh, you're absolutely right. The uh, data processing chief information officer really deals with the movement and integration of data, not with mm -hmm. the content. And right. no one in the organization deals with the content. Really, the rise of the chief data officer didn't even occur until after the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah, right. And even then, it was mostly just a governance role trying to set some you know, processes around. You know, we need to go back to our Aristotle. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll be honest. The um, meaning of things. I mean, yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. Well, it's well, true. Right. But <laughs> we, started with the, we started with the philosophy of and the concepts of reality and trust and all those different things. Yes. We're trying to get down to discrete things that we can say are facts and we can build upon. But I think your point, Frank, about you know applying data science rather than algorithmic science, if I can call yeah, it that, exactly, is really a, a fascinating insight because it suggests the need to apply science around the data as if yeah. You know, I, I know we use the term data factory, but I almost look at data as almost a fluid that we exist in, like water. How do I know that that water is okay to drink? It depends on where it was sourced from, to Mike's earlier point. Yeah. And it depends on what those things are in the water and the relationships to them and all the things that worked on that water to the point where I know that I can consume it without worrying about it. That, that, Jeff, is a good analogy, but instead of water, I would use blood, because blood, <laughs> blood makes all the other parts work. <laughs> uh, uh, Jeffrey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I wrote a paper with Pricewaterhouse way back in the beginning of my, you know, long ago, on uh, making the, the, the case for understanding data components using a bakery analogy. And, and I, I'll send you the paper, but in short, the recipe is the data, right? It's, it's, you know, how do you combine the flour, sugar, water, eggs? Are they separated? Is, is, a, is a cold butter different from hot butter? So, so you have to understand the recipe. You have to understand the in, information technology being the ovens, you know, the processes. You have to have business processes, which is your dough transfer, your storage, and your humidity. And you have to understand your, your, you know, so I'm sorry, the ingredients are the data and then the yeah, yeah. business rules are the recipe. But um, we have to put these things in context without acting, like without speaking down to people so that they understand some of these fundamentals so they can see the implications of it to their organization. And we have not done that very well, right? We have to- yeah, this, No, that's right. a good point. I don't know, you're right here because I use an example when I do the data analysis class, I have how you make chocolate chip cookies. And then I have the classic set of ingredients. And I says, if the engineering group were doing the ingredients, how would they characterize it? Take a 30 millimeter pipette, fill it with 10 millimeters of this and take this and take 14 grams of that, stir aggressively, yada, yada, and you know, it's totally different than what a, a chef would do. The description of what the ingredients is different. The measurements absolutely. are different. Yeah, absolutely different. And I gave three examples. I said, this is why it's hard to integrate stuff in a business. 
is because we have these different interpretations. It seems to me, Frank, that if we do spend some time on these fundamental concepts and figure out how to present them in the language of business correctly, everybody that I've met in financial services is very smart. They, yeah. they absolutely oh, yeah. get no these short of that. <laughs> this, is, this is not a question of cognition yeah. capability. It's just a question of, are you thinking, because they have 47 other things on their mind. Yeah. I remember I was sitting, I was sitting in the office of Goldman Sachs with the chairman of one of our data committees and we were all excited about it. And I go, so why isn't Goldman doing this? And, you know, and, and, and the bottom line is it's just not on the agenda of exec management. They have all these other things that this one doesn't make the cut. And we've got to recognize that. We've got to elevate this, put it in business terms, understand the implications, understand the business rationale that this is wise policy. You yeah, know, this is a good point. That I have never seen anything written on the on the on the on the fundamentals of the science of data. The science of data, not data science. Yeah, the science yeah. of data. We word it yeah. that way. And and I wonder what those fundamentals would be. And it's like you were saying, you'd have meaning and you have this, you have that, you know, and, and how would you treat that in order to get an integrated view of your data and enterprise? That's right. I, yeah. I am I'll, I'll send you what I've got if you're if you're interested. I've done some writing on this because ah. I'm completely convinced that we have to make people understand the principles of data management first. Mm -hmm. We have to demystify the standards world. We have to make sure that we understand the process associated with implementing or, you know, the operating model and the governance model of the organization. And we have to translate that into exec, technology, operations, marketing, regulatory, because everybody has a perspective. Okay, a quick, a quick question on that. Why, you know, you know what the DAME is, the Data Administration Management Center. Why aren't they, why aren't they doing this? I don't hear that from them. The DAME wheel, you mean? The DAME yeah. firms? Why aren't they doing that? The, the well, science well, of data. Most of their technologists. And and they're they're you know the people that were handling the systems and processes. Yeah, same they as true. A lot of they, stuff. I'm yeah. a huge fan of Dame. I think their Dame wheel was good, but it was really on the technology of data management as opposed yeah. to on the principles okay. of meaning. Yeah. It, it's what I ran into when I was talking to the business analysts. I asked, "How many come from IT?" Every hand went up. Yeah, yeah. you have a technology view of all of a sudden of an, of business analysis. That's right. What tool and, should I use? Okay. And and all of the data management world came from IT. Mm -hmm. I know yeah, I do the benchmarking for the industry. They all came from IT. And yeah, uh, yeah I agree. And they, they they look at the world through their IT lens, which is nothing wrong with that. It's just a different lens. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Lens. I don't see anything. It's not wrong. It's just that it's a different lens. That's right. And and when I talk to the business analyst, I says, you need to have a larger view. For example, how is what you're doing in the system relate? To the financial aspect of the company, to this part of the company, to that part, they don't know. You, if you mentioned something, they don't deal with it. Mike, you mentioned something earlier, which I wanted to revisit because I think it's really important. You said early on that, that one of the things that you have seen around data and standards and the reality of it in many organizations is that it's mapped and matched against the tools and technology which is, you know, that's the reinforcement of DEMA and all that, because that's where everybody thinks about it, as opposed to the word, the term that, you know, Frank introduced, which I think is really interesting to think about. If we said that data is the lifeblood of the company, not necessarily the money, it would no, change the way we think about it. Without question, you, you triggered a thought in my mind. One of the challenges that we all face is the fact that relational technology still works, doesn't break. It, it fulfills its functions and it's very good for computing. And a relational technology, I'm mean, going to call everything columnar technology, is basically a location based process, right? A column and a row and an intersection, and that's the data point. 
And all many of the developments, big data developments are still based on that same relational paradigm. And the problem is it's very rigid because it's kind of managed by schemas and you have definitions that are not linked, you know, they're, they're referenced by, by reference. And, and it's structured for specific objectives. And if you want to look at something from a different perspective, you've got to go restructure, unravel your joins, your keys, your foreign keys. And, and no one wants to do that because it's very, very yeah. difficult. Yeah, this is a good point. One, one, one of the things is when I was teaching analytics, I said, the matrix is the most general form of model you can have. And the reason is very simple. It's a collection of relationships, not tables, not rows and columns. It's a That's collection true. of relationships grouped together to look that way. People have a hard time grasping that. I said, you can take that collection right out of that matrix and store it as a pair, which you do in graph theory. That's right. You sort of, yeah. uh, you know, as two nodes and a link. Tri triple in, in graph. Uh, yeah, triple, yeah. And who thought of this? They thought of this, you know, 150 years ago. If you go read philosophy and logic, they described object-oriented thinking in humans. It was described at that time. Wittgenstein and, and all these guys were writing Brussels, where they were writing papers about this stuff. You're absolutely right. You are Aristotle Wittgenstein, you know, the yes, you know, half stuff is two, two and a half thousand years old. <laughs> the history of the semantic web, however, is simpler and and closer than that. Right? And and uh, the problem was the Department of Defense was trying to collect data from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it was all stuck in Excel tables and relational and structures. Yes. And, and they're trying to pull it all together, reconcile it in real time to know, do I move this? Do I ship that? Do I reallocate here? And they couldn't do it. Right? So they had an all hands meeting run by DARPA and they um, invented triples, right? And triples are basically a sentence-like structure of two nouns, a subject and an object, yep. linked together by a predicate. So it's a sentence. So the concepts are embedded with the data, not separately as a schema or by reference to a glossary. And all of a sudden, you can now understand exactly what the data is in context because it's a sentence structure where meaning is embedded as mm -hmm. opposed to a physical location structure where meaning is dispersed and that is absolutely correct huge yeah. Yeah. so the dod gave us tcpip right the internet right and, and tim berners lee gave us size and iris and and identifiers think about it. that that comes out of telco those are telephone uh, well, numbers. You, but yes, it was actually <laughs> yeah, like telephone concerned. numbers. You just That's... keep expanding and making the number bigger. And <laughs> and you got XXX dot XXX dot, you know, you got an area code, exchange code, and you got 10,000 lines. That was based on the physical structure of an That's exchange. Right. But it doesn't right. have to be. What Berners Lee figured out that you could have three dot three dot three dot, you know, you could do it that way, and you can make it infinitely long. So these <laughs> gifts of network interoperability systems interoperability, yep. and now the DOD gave us data interoperability. interoperability. Now exist. You have, we have these tools. The tools it's are there. First, it is so exciting for the first time ever, all of the components exist to solve this little dilemma of incongruence and structural rigidity. But you know, the scope does grow because when I was looking last time I looked at SAP, which is which is a couple of years ago, you know, you look at about two thousand, maybe three thousand processes, but over eighty thousand fields. So the data problem is much more complex than yeah. interrelating processes. Okay. Yeah. In, in a sense. Yeah. You know, so it's not that easy to solve. The magnitude is big, you know. Yeah, so and, and we should not we should not race through that statement because there is a cost. Yeah. to adopting standards and to mm -hmm. shifting mindset. And it's a real one, right? It's why I wrote this last paper called On Costs and Obstacles. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is because you always do have to do mapping. You know, you know, this means that. That is the same as this. This process yeah. over here, you know. And the, 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 the benefit is you want to do the mapping once. You don't want to keep yeah. doing it over and over and over and over again. And we don't do that. We, you know, so you do have to do the mapping. Right. Yeah, you do have to have 
you know, ontologists that create these things. I have to have well engineered, mm -hmm. but it's not cost. It's not expensive. It's just uh, organizationally cumbersome. Yes. Right? You know, so the good news is, and you don't have to rip apart your existing infrastructure to do it, right? It's just mm -hmm. everything can be linked because of the gift of a, a single identifier where everything yeah. gets gets referenced to it. It's no longer a rip and replace problem. Mm -hmm. It is, but it is a mapping problem and it is it an is. engineering problem and they're absolutely a skill set dilemma. We don't, you know, few people know how to do this. So, so where do, so let's go back and let's go back and principles. revisit. Let, let's go back and revisit something that we started to talk about, which I thought was really intriguing is how do we put the science back into this so that we can That's start to just build. Saying we should, we should collect all these little bits and create a science of data type little booklet or something to start yeah. this idea. To think I'm, all in, I'm all in. I, yeah. um, first of all, I, my, my post-retirement career is to do the business case for data management. I, I'm, I'm quick, cringing a little bit about data science because that's already been absconded. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting it because term already. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so this is a really interesting point. Many times I'm in organizations and they'll say you can't use that term. I like, for example, if I want to use like something like account to describe something, it's like, oh no, no, accounting is already said that can only be used over here. And I'm like, are is that because it's going to confuse them? Is it because they're concerned about incongruity? Is it concerned about homogeneity or is it just that they don't want anybody else they, because they're the police for that term? Either way. The um, answer is all of them. Right. <laughs> but, 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 but remember, right. Jeffrey, meaning, not words. Yes. I do not care what you call it. Call right. it thread. Doesn't right. matter. Well, and a colleague of mine a couple of years ago, he he would always come up with some very colorful terms whenever the 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 term police would come to 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 the gate and say you can't use that, you can't say that, and so forth. Yeah. So he would just call different things, and as long as he had the right context around it, everybody knew what he was talking about. But we got past the the term issues, like for example, the wars over the term product. What do we mean by product? And you're not going to change the way people talk and think, and you should not try. Let right. them call it whatever you want. We who are doing the data management infrastructure, you know, and we and we must look at this as infrastructure of our organizations. But we who are doing this infrastructure oh, yeah. need to be able yeah. to allow them to call it whatever they want, but it does reference this singular, unmovable, precise identifier and triple description okay yeah this is this is a good point one of the things that we learned is if you let them use their own language but you have a standard corporate language eventually it'll merge into that corporate language it just takes time it takes five six years because we found this out with multiple erp systems and what happens is since they all have different naming conventions in them that uh, what you do is you let them have that but you map to the corporate and over time, they just start adopting the corporate because it's easier. And the next time they do a system change, they all of a sudden they have more corporate terms. And over a five or six year period, everybody now is using the corporate terms, like 90%. Do so exactly do that, but, uh, but to meaning not to another term. Yes. But exactly that. Yeah. So is there is there any value to applying some of the concepts that have been applied in biology around you know, the Latin-esque of meaning? and how they have built those kinds of structures. And, you know, so we can understand how the basics of chemistry life and so forth and how all these things come together so that we can build, you know, more complex ecosystems around that. How do we do something similar for data? Because at some point we're going to reach an, you know, a, a logical end state for how many different ways we can do things. And at the same time, we, if we continue to disperse and diminish our understandability around the way things work, how how do we, how is that going to impact our ability to create progress at the same pace that we would like, and we simply just turn it over to these algorithmic individuals called data scientists to say we don't know how, what this stuff is, where it is, and they're going to create the chat GPTs to figure it all out for us. 
and displace us as opposed to saying, when do we start applying the science to further our own capabilities and make sure that this, the algorithms are born of this science rather yeah, than- Yeah, let's unpack that a little bit because you asked, yeah. the very first question you asked was the correct one. And then you started to fantasize about how it gets used, which is <laughs> what everybody always does, right? So I had my just, Asimov moment. Just just take <laughs> just take the concept of customer. Well, that's a vague term. Doesn't mean anything because it means everything. Is it someone who bought something? Is it someone who signed up for a website? Is it someone who bought something repeatedly? Is it something, someone who I have changed and they have stuck with me? Because all of those concepts are real and they're important to people. You know, if we yeah. call them all customer, then we have no idea what it is. But the real things do exist. Oh, first time someone came to my website, you know, it's a thing. Call it. You call know, it this is, don't yeah, this is a good point. Thing. Because this is a stumbling block that both Jeff and I had with the business architecture people. Because it's not pragmatic that way. They, they, they want a generic term of customer. And I know of instances where this has been proposed in very large organizations and the response from the management is, these people do not understand how this business works. That's right. Bang. That tells us something real quick. That the terminology they're using was totally incompatible with the way they think of their business. Amen to that. that yeah. And that is so important, which is why we always start with what does the business do? What do they need, regardless of where they get it or what they call it? Right. Yeah. You know, and we can't skip that part. You know, that's that drives everything, in my opinion. Right. You know, I think I, I wonder oftentimes about how the name data science came out. And I realized one time that they are they're applying data algorithms to data, and the result is they think science. It's not, it's engineering. And they're now, if you notice, they're now about adopting that type of terminology. Hmm. They use the term data engineering. Yeah. You know, and rather than data science, you hear more about data engineers. Well, data. you know, it's all the marketing people that take a good concept and then just drive it to the end of the ground. Like knowledge, knowledge <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's better than calling it a data, <laughs> data science because it's not data science per se, but it is data. It is data technology, data engineering. Engineering is part of the technology development once the science has been done, you know. We are now talking about knowledge engineers and, and yeah. you know, and, and we do have a big problem with the lexicon. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. But I, but I, really, I don't want to get away from this, this, this idea <laughs> of capturing the fundamental principles of data meaning yeah. and, and why it's important and why it is wise policy for organizations is absolutely a noble quest. Yeah. When, when, do we, when do we move from the practice of data and data engineering and build the science of data so that we can apply engineering around the science of it. Do you know what I'm saying? In a, in a similar fashion that all mature, you know, capabilities that we now rely upon to move forward. If you think about what you opened up with, Mike, as you know, some of the key points around data, it's the essence of everything that we do. And yet it is, the, it is more and more becoming the reality. And so it just behooves us to start to apply science to the data so that we can start to engineer the, our reality and understand how things should work, interoperability, integration, meaning, all the things that you've touched upon. So I think there's there, something I, there. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because one wise person, a CDO somewhere, said, I care about three types of data, stuff that must be right, stuff that should be right, and stuff that it's okay if it's right. And not all data fits into must be right, yeah. right? Some of it is just, you know, indicative, you know, and all I want is a general trend of which way the market is going because that's all I need. And we cannot try to force fit our data precision objective onto everybody, right? So some of it has to be divided into the information intensive applications that need precision 
to deal with their complexities and their nuances that really want to embrace this data meaning engineering concept, right? I really like to come up with a label because it's a really good idea. Right, um, right. But not everybody needs to fall in that category because you get pushback. Agreed. Oh, well, and, and I think that, you know, there's a certain amount of, there's a, there's a need for some of that forming and storming. And then there's a need to make sure that things fall in and, you know, are done a certain way. We do the same thing with safety engineering and with, you know, applying engineering principles. You don't have to apply it to making a sandwich, but it probably makes, an, it's probably important if you're going to make a drug or a chemical that's going to interact with other systems AKA the analogy of, well, that data may be consumed by other systems or very important things. And therefore it needs to maybe be born of all the things that you mentioned early on at the same time, how do we ensure trust in this if we aren't following some kind of science? No, is it, I didn't mean to minimize the, the objective. I just do understand that if you try to push everybody into a narrow little hole, it gets to be crowded and no one goes through it. Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. I look at data less as a discrete set of entities and more as a fluid. And you can't really force everybody through the same water standards. Some water standards are higher than others. In some cases, I'm just washing the laundry and it's okay if it's got a few impurities or whatever else, but if I'm drinking it, it probably needs to meet certain standards. Frank and I were just talking about this, this whole notion that there's probably something there in the science around data and some level. Maybe that's something that we can tease at. I think there's something there. There's a thread to pull on. And both of us are kind of intrigued by the idea and definitely would like to continue discussions online off. In the meantime, I'm going to send you two papers that I wrote, or maybe three, laying out what I think are the fundamental principles of data management that I've learned, and I'll be interested in your thoughts. Yeah. What I was trying to tease at before you, your, your screen froze earlier is the idea that there's probably some things that we can start to do and think about with the, the topics that we covered. At the same time, there's there's some interesting topics we haven't even really delved into, and with we can probably bring in some additional folks to talk through those. I'd like to think that you know we can evolve some of these concepts so that there's a recognition around the need for applying science, scientific principles, and principles of good governance along the lines of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike would be a good one because I know that Mike here, I know a gentleman named Mike who is a president of DEMA in Chicago, and he was instrumental in developing the DEMA wheel. So he would be an interesting one to have on board because he has similar viewpoints, but from a different perspective. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's just concerned about the management's view of this and stuff like that. And he's dealing now with a large bank. And yeah. these that this be this all these issues we talked about are there, you know. So, yeah, I've always I've always had a fond relationship with Dima. So, there's a lot of interesting things we unraveled a bit here. So, so there's some interesting threads to pull on. I think we can summarize all of this as the goal for information literacy, and there re there really is a need for people who are going to be operating in a complex and interdependent world to understand the fundamentals, principles, and practices of data content management. So I am all in on the importance of information literacy to get people, you know, raise the tide. So anything I can do, I'm happy to do. Great, great. All right. Yeah, well, I'm wondering, is... yeah just ahead. one quick point. I'm wondering if we can't, I don't know if this make, even makes any sense, but to develop something like the Linnaean system for data where you would have, you know, where you have a, you know, a species and, and genera and all the stuff that they have in it. And we would have stuff like customer, the types of customers and stuff, you know, something like that. If there's something we could do that would structure the world of data so that you could do science with it. I have the Maslow hierarchy of data that mm -hmm. I pulled together with the chief data officer, the CFPB. Okay. Yeah, we, we, These we, are good starting places. I think we have bits and pieces that we should try pulling together and see what kind of concept emerges rather than trying to force a concept on it. 
Well, that brings us full circle around the biological themes that have kind of woven their way through our conversation. I'll leave it there. Frank and Mike, great conversation. Thank you. Great meeting you, Mike. Thanks for joining us. You All too. Right. Take care.